All right, welcome back to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout and to our show. And this is a perfect title for today, The Issues and Challenges in Today's Fire Service. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my very good bud and Hump Day Hangout co-host, Louisville little Assistant Chief Terrence Elroy McGrath. My, good morning. My bud. <laughs> um, uh, Chief John Salka is under the weather, so he's not going to be joining us today. Uh, uh, he's trying to keep everybody in his house healthy uh, with him staying away from right now. But we've got... Uh, Chief Scott Thompson, he's part of our the five we call it uh, uh, of our team that we have on Hump Day Hang Us, the third Hump Day. Uh, Chief Scott Thompson from the Colony, Texas, which we said before is booming. Uh, <laughs> we've got the uh, the Godfather, Michael Corleone, aka Chief Bobby Halton, the boss with us. Uh, my my big brother, my big brother. Um, and oh, by the way, oh, I, Scott, Bobby, I forgot. Chief Scott Thompson, author of the best selling book through Fire Engineering Books, The Functional Fire Company. Um, we have to do that, Scott, every show. That's our routine now is, uh, to, <laughs> to pump out. There you go. The only thing uh, I can say, there must be a lot of those books sitting around and somebody <laughs> said, push them, get them, get them sold. <laughs> Available. Um, great, great Christmas gifts. Yeah. Uh, it's, it is. Well, first of all, it's a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great book. So, but uh, we've got another great topic for you today. And one that's been coming for a long time. Uh, medical cannabis in the fire service. Uh, again, we've got we got our, our crew with us, and we've got some some great folks joining us, some special guests uh, today. We've got firefighter, and I'm going to have them each introduce their bio uh, when we get to it here a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, Stephanie. Um, let me back up for a second here because Stephanie White did a great article for us uh, right as we were lining this up for fire engineering. We'll talk about that. I'm sure Pete's going to post that as well um on on medical marijuana and firefighters a better way to handle pain and ptsd published by fire engineering magazine the magazine um, we've got wichita falls fire chief our good friend my good friend chief ken prilliman and his daughter colette patricia who and again very interesting background when we talk about this when it comes to our topic um ken and colette are work, currently working with the texas fire chiefs regarding this very topic, and I'm going to have them explain why later. Um, as a reminder, if you have any questions, zip over to uh, Twitter and our social media feeds, and our producer, Pete, will send them our way. We do our best uh, to get to them. Uh, he throws them on our chat line off to the side, and we, we try to do our best. Sometimes we can't. But uh, Chief Halton, Terry, Scott, welcome back, and, and welcome Stephanie Collette and Chief Prilliman. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you. Well, let, let Let's do this if we could. Let's go kind of around um, uh, with our guests here. Um, and I'm, I'm, I don't know how it is on your screen. I'm going to kind of go left to right here, but um, in no particular order. Uh, uh, but uh, St Stephanie, a little background on yourself. And then, uh, you know, we'll get to the article in a second. And then maybe we'll do Colette in chief. Okay. Why are you making me start first? No pressure. <laughs> You're on the left-hand side of my screen, so I got... I know, I can see them at the top. Well, <laughs> I've been a professional firefighter for the past 17 years, but 19 years overall in the fire service to volunteer. Um, and really what, what got me into this, because I'm just going to jump straight into that boring career, data technician, uh, a firefighter medic in Fairfax County, Virginia, which is right outside D.C. It's uh, a well-known department, pretty big size, about 1,700 people. But what really got me into this topic was starting to do probably over the past three years behavioral health stuff. Mm -hmm. So that that was very eye opening. Starting to work with people and see what medications they're being put on, and then research medicate researching those medications and seeing the side effects and saying, "Whoa, you can't go into a burning building on this." So that's, that's my ground as it pertains to this uh, conversation. Okay, and, we'll, and we're going to get back. So I want to talk a little bit about what you wrote as well when we get going with this conversation. So Colette, background on you. Um, well, I'm not in the fire service, but I'm very closely connected to it as my father has been for 30 years. Um, I'm uniquely positioned in between this field of medical cannabis, PTSD, mental health. So I'm a meditation teacher. I'm a coach. Um, I'm an entrepreneur and I am an expert in plant medicines and I work with people specifically in helping them use medical cannabis to 
um, not only just manage symptoms, uh, but ultimately to really alleviate and be freed of them through different modalities, medical cannabis being one of them. And so I don't look at medical cannabis as it is, as if it is some magical wand that you can wave and, and be healed of things. But I think when paired with other practices for mental health, the potential that it holds is really, really powerful. And to Stephanie's point, the danger of these pharmaceutical meds um, that we don't even think twice about um, in comparison is really, it's kind of shocking. And so uh, dad and I had a conversation back in May and he had expressed that there's concern about getting, finding, recruiting, and keeping high quality people in the fire service. And I know that we all want good people, good, healthy people in the fire service. And if we're not attending to the mental health and uh, the state of their being, then that's going to be more and more difficult as time goes by. So I'm just really, I have a huge heart for the fire service, obviously, because of my personal connection to that, but I have a huge heart for supporting people using natural alternative modalities for wellness and for healing. Well, and that's a great point. And, you know, and again, um, we've all, we actually, before we went live, we were talking about a friend of ours uh, and, and sometimes when you see people off on that track and you've got different doctors trying to manage different pains and different things and, you know, kind of throwing stuff around there and it doesn't work. Um, we, we've got to keep an open mind. This is like we posted, Pete and I posted, when we posted, this is a topic long overdue. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to bring something up about that in a second, but Chief Prilliman, your background and, and um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead with that, Ken. And then I, I want to pick your brain a little bit on as to what the, the paper that you and Colette authored and, and kind of we'll, we'll jump in there. Great. Well, it's great to be here. And uh, actually, long before Colette was born, I stepped up on a tailboard for the first time in 1978 uh, and served about half of my career so far in volunteer accommodation departments. I was appointed chief of department outside of Minneapolis, a city called Brooklyn Park in 2008, and served continuously as fire chief since then. Came to Wichita Falls, Texas in July of uh, 2019 uh, and have been trying to be actively engaged both here locally and moving uh, our department forward, as well as engaged with the Texas Fire Chiefs Association. Well, and, and again, and this is a topic, and you know, Bobby and I've talked about Terry and Scott and everything, especially for the bosses out there that are trying to, I, I've always thought we've done a pretty poor job of educating fire chiefs. Um, uh, I'm on a couple of different college advisory boards, and one of them finally has come up with a master's degree for fire chiefs that, that teach fire chiefs how to be fire chiefs, labor relations, everything else like that. But we take, we take very good firefighters and we make them pretty good company officers and we make them decent like chief officers. And we do a horrible job in the fire service, horrible job at preparing people for, for that big chair. And I see it when I consult, Ken, you see, I mean, you, you know, you've done some, some great work with the Texas fire chiefs we do. I travel all over and I'm, I'm amazed at how many people that are in charge that have absolutely nothing behind them, no help. And then they're depending on HR department that if you're in Louisville, Terry, blessed with the great HR department they have there. And I had when I was with Terry, what if you don't have that? You're kind of, you're relying on, you know, what you read, which is usually wrong and everything else. So, and I said something, Bobby, you and I talked about this a while back, God, but probably back Scott, you remember back in, in like 2005 and six or whatever, when, when Colorado started legalizing and doing things, my buddy, Rick Ballantyne's a chief in Aspen. And I went out there and the first thing I was worried about, forget even medical. I was in, in my lobby, the hotel in Aspen and everybody in the lobby was smoking. And I'm like, if I get ran, I, so I came back and said, well, all our guys go ski in there. How do we, I mean, you know, and they said, well, we'll go like what the Navy does. If you're exposed to it, come back when you're off and leave, report to your commander that you were. But I go, this is this is going to be an issue when it comes to people coming back to work and, you know, so on and so forth or whatever. And then, you know, as we kept traveling down that path, it was like the I, I, that, that phrase bothers me, but I got to say the elephant in the room that we just kept going. Yeah, it's there. And it kept getting closer. And I was just in Maine teaching. uh and we went out after dinner, we're standing in the park lot, talking to five of us, and everybody's smoking there. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's all approved here. And I'm like, so what do you do for firefighters that come back to work, you know, back on duty, you know, like alcohol? What do you, you know, there's got to be the parameters and how long, you know, and it was all over the place. And there's some great people, but it was all over the place. So when I said, and Pete said, we posted a topic that's long overdue for the fire service, this, this is it. Now, 
turn it over to the the medical side. Um, you know, Stephanie, what you talked about about what we're doing with all that throwing medicine at everybody, trying to help them, and sometimes that we're creating addicts and people that are OD and having problems later on. To Ken, do you do you want to kind of uh, kick things off from your end with um, uh, you wrote you and Colette wrote a great paper, but. Uh, maybe not named the department, but uh, or whatever. But the, the the situation you had with the firefighter that that uh, got popped and then came back and phoned up some things and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, I'll be glad to. I'm wondering though if if we ought to start. There was a question that that we uh, briefly touched on before the podcast began. I think it might help us get grounded. It might help our, our viewers if. We all understood why we have distinguished medical cannabis from marijuana. And you know, maybe I'll let Colette kind of take that issue on because I think it's, it's an important distinction that I had to learn. And in order to understand the impetus for what we're doing and, and where we think we need to go, I think you got to start there. Perfect point. Colette? Yeah, I'd love to. So I think it's really important as we approach this topic in general is to everybody to understand that we are all carrying deep stigma around this plant. And so the, the stigma that has come through propaganda and an agenda from the war on drugs and this attempt to villainize and demonize this medicine, this plant, is all deeply ingrained in every single one of us. Even if you are an advocate for the plant and even if you consume it medically or recreationally, we all still hold that. And so the term marijuana was coined during that season, during the 70s and 80s, this war on drug propaganda as an attempt to further villainize and demonize this plant. But name cannabis is the name of the plant, the way that it has scientifically been labeled and named. And we use that name as medicine. Medical cannabis was in everyone's, you know, cabinets as normal as Advil would be now before prohibition started back in the 40s. And so this term marijuana has been intentionally used to create fear and stigma around this plant, marginalizing and uh, positioning it as something perpetually in a race and um, aggravated way to understand this plant. And so I believe that that term should never be used in reference to cannabis. Cannabis is a plant, it is an herb, it grows in the earth, and that is what we've named it scientifically. And when we learn how to use better language and we learn how to intentionally choose the way that we want to speak of this plant, it helps all of us reframe our relationship and reframe that internalized stigma that we all hold about this plant. And so I really encourage everybody to start using the word cannabis and leave the M word far beyond in the past with prohibition because it, it's not relevant and it's not um, perpetuating the, not only the respect, but the power and the potency of what this plant has to offer for us. So, well, and I, and I think there, there's a lot of people that really don't even understand. They have no idea. They're like, they, they don't, I think a lot of people say it because they have no idea. They just say, well, I've always heard it was called marijuana. They don't mean anything by it. They're not like, Oh, don't you're bad. You know, they just, that's what they, that's what you hear. That's what you call, you, you call, but it was a great point. Ken, like I said, we talked about this when Pete asked the question early on to differentiate between the two, because it is something that there are people out there that say there are people that, that I'll just say they use it, that call it that, that mm -hmm. they don't, they don't even mean anything bad by it. It's just something that has evolved as, as part of the language. So I'm glad you, right. you said that. Yeah. And I, you know, I want to, I want to be real clear, uh, Stephan and I spent some time getting to know each other this week. The, the, the distinction was not intended to, she used it in, her, in the title of her paper, a paper that I, I love. I just really like the work that she's doing. It's not an indictment necessarily against even some of the medical community. Like if you go get a, a, a medical cannabis card, they're marketed as medical marijuana in some location. Some people believe that a, this card is gives you the medical justification to use marijuana. And what, what, what our approach has been, and it's not necessarily the only one, it's, maybe it's not even right, but the idea of smoking marijuana, whether you have a, a valid diagnosis, is, is probably not the right answer because of the way the THC in marijuana, in the plant that's not been uh, specifically manufactured for medical use, uh, the THC in there is too high for high heat, high stress environments. 
And so I think there's an educational piece that, that our, even our firefighters need to understand that in an environment where we embrace the use of the plant medicine cannabis, that's not synonymous with smoking some weed and believing that's, that this get out of jail free card is, is your protection. Well, and that's so, something Bobby, Bobby brought up. You know, we talked about this before about the first thing you said is, you know, is the different levels, the different potencies, the, the, you know, the whole, it's just not this, hey, look what I just grew or look what I bought down the street or from, you know, Tommy on the corner, I can use it, you know, and a lot of the movies play it that way, unfortunately, where they, they play it as it's just that simple. And that, and that's a great point because, and, and Bobby, you and I talked about, it. yeah, and there's different levels of alcohol too. I mean, you can, you can drink, you know, a light beer or you can go out and, you know, to get hammered drinking, uh, you know, a, a, a liquor, you know, something else. So, I mean, there's different levels in that as well as this, that I think a lot of people are missing uh, when it comes to that. Bobby, do you have something or? Yeah. And, and so it's even more complex than that to Colette and, and Stephanie's point. Um, alcohol as a substance, right? We, we, we immediately think of beer and wine and everything else, <clears throat> but there are legitimate medicinal uses of the substance alcohol, which is the, which is the base product of your whiskeys and your scotches and your vodkas. That is incredibly important for medical purposes. And it's, and it's, it's used in conjunction with all other kinds of uh, substances, right? So there's, there's two distinct conversations. So it's, it's what, it's what people normally refer to as a wickedly complex issue, right? And then you compound that with the fact that we're on the precipice of probably nationwide decriminalization of the substance marijuana, the plant, the, what we commonly call on this marijuana, being available for recreational use by the masses. That's going to be a whole other issue for the American Fire Service. That's going to be, it's almost separate and distinct from this conversation, because what Stephanie and Colette are talking about is, is the use of cannabis, which is been prescribed, which is being um, titrated, I guess that's the correct word, medically titrated to, to people's size, weight, body chemistry need so that they can overcome uh, uh, sleep issues, they can overcome anxiety issues. And I, I'm on board with Stephanie and Colette. Um, and, and, and there's no limits to my hypocrisy because I'm only alive because of chemistry. Uh, that, and that's a God's honest truth. Everybody on here knows I'm a, a cancer survivor, and the only reason I'm alive is because I shoved Drano up my butt, you know, repeatedly in order to, to be here, which is fine. And, 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 and thank you to all the people who, who make that stuff. And, and, and none of it's natural, though, you know, quite frankly, none of it's natural. So, you know, it, it's, it's a very, very complex issue. And I wrote an editorial on it back in 2020, um, oddly enough. And, and I called it Wayne, Billy, and Susan meet Cheech and Chong. And, th and the reason for that is if you're not aware of the incredibly tumultuous um, political and, and sociological uh, elements that had to do with prohibition, you had the KKK, the suffragette movement, the, the, the evangelists all coming together to outlaw alcohol, which is a really interesting group of people when you think about it, right? <laughs> And, 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 and they were successful, right? A small intolerant group of people can control just about any society because they are in fact intolerant. They refuse to allow others to be heard to Colette's point, you know? And so you have people who are going to be, you know, just vilifying this, this, this substance and people who are gonna be absolutely saying it's completely harm free and da, 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 da. And somewhere in the middle is probably the truth. And I don't know where that middle is. And, and, and for full disclosure, I'm a teetotaler. I, you know, I'm not, I don't use alcohol. I don't use marijuana. The only drugs I do are prescribed by multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical corporations. And, 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 and they tell me it'll keep me alive for another couple of months. So I take it, but the, and, and, and that's all well and good. But so, so please don't think anybody who's listening to this, that we've got any answers here. We've got a lot of questions and, and we've got to start having this conversation with people like Stephanie and Colette and Ken, who've thought it through more broadly than I have, because, you know, I, I have, full disclosure, I haven't. 
Um, I, I, obviously, I, I'm very aware of it. I wrote an editorial two and a half years ago trying to get people to look at it and think about it. But this is exactly what I wanted to have. People that have thought deeply about it, that have, uh, you know, kind of figured it out. But I'll tell you right now, it's going to evolve. Even if we come up with a standard right now, once it becomes legalized recreationally, then we've got a whole nother set of, you know, how, how do we, because we, we do not ban firefighters from drinking. I can, I've seen it. I, re I really have. I've actually seen firefighters drinking alcohol on a couple of occasions. So there's that. So keep that in the back of your mind while we have this conversation. Right now, Stephanie and Colette and Ken are talking about people with a demonstrated medical need, right? Am I correct in that? That's, that's the area, Chief, that we have focused on is, you know, there, there's outliers in, in the research that we did. We discovered a, a, a firefighter in a city who was really trying to cover up recreational use by getting one of these online medical cannabis cards. And, you know, to your point, th this, is, this is the tip of the spear. Uh, and, and we've chosen a very narrow sliver. In fact, I have a, a funny story to share. When Colette and I first developed this idea of a paper, based on the research and the efficacy of other plant medicine, Colette was quick to say, Dad, we need to talk about microdosing. Now, microdosing, for those that don't know what that is, that's very tiny little doses of mushrooms or LSD, which is proving to be very, very effective with, in the military for PTSD. And I said whoa, 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 honey, this is the fire service. You're coming in way too hot. And yet we passed the uh, draft of our research paper to a medical director whose first comment was, I think you're on the right track, but you're going to have to talk about microdosing. So there's a lot of issues to begin to unpack. And I think to Rick's question earlier, the impetus from my perspective, and, and I think, you know, Stephanie has a unique uh, perspective that she's come at it. Mine is, I, I believe leadership has to develop some ability to look around corners. And this, this is my looking around corners. We can ignore all of this plant medicine, all forms of it, the efficacy of it, and it's going to wash over us, or we can begin to have these kind of conversations and get ready for it. And it's coming. We talk, I can talk about it. That was my whole point, Ken, with Aspen. That was just one awakening of recreational use. And the next thing was, well, the municipal, I mean, I'm like, okay, now we've got, like Bobby said, two, two different worlds going on here. And, and, you know, we've got a problem right now in the fire service alone when, and, and Terry, you and I talked about this, Scott, we did another show about, well, you know, I, I call in sick for two days in a row. I got to go to my doctor, you know, make him write a note for me and lie that I wasn't on my hunting trip. I was actually sick for two days and then bring my doctor's note in, you know, unlike the FDNY, where if you call for nine hours, you have to go to the doctor in Brooklyn, drive there, pay your tolls, your parking, and have the doctor see you. But my thing was, Terry, right? So let me just go to WebMD, or not WebMD, Metal, Teladoc, and I get my note, and I come in, there's my note. And you're like, really? You know, I mean, if you, and if you set it up ahead of time, you know, so you've got that. And then you've got, Ken, I want to get back to it a little bit about what one of the things you mentioned in your paper, one of the things we talked about, um, was you know the 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 ability for people to go out and I'm just gonna say this phony up and the, there's always gonna be those people that are always doing what's wrong over here no matter what we do no matter what we do in the fire service no matter what policy we look at there's always gonna be somebody here trying to break it trying to figure a way to get around it or whatever because they're human beings and as great as I, we all love the fire service they're gonna there there's always gonna be someone trying to do something like that you know and you've got those people now that are doing it where, you know, they're, uh, yeah, where they're, you know, they're doing what happened there. Um, and, you know, and I want to get to Stephanie in a second here with, with what, what drove her to do her article, but Ken back to just explain briefly what happened in this fire department uh, in Texas with this, you know, the guy that uh, phoned, you know, you know, the story, you wrote it. So. Yeah, so the, the, uh, the issue is, like many of us, this department had a random testing program and a uh, firefighter reported to, to the test center and, and popped hot for THC. Uh, when you know, called in to, uh, to account for that, produced what appeared to be a, a medical cannabis card. 
the uh, combination of command staff and HR began to look at the source of the card and came to realize, like, like I've recently walked through the steps. I didn't go all the way, but I walked through the steps and learned that for $20 online, you can apply for one of these cards. You pay an additional fee for a, for a telephone consultation. Um, and if, if any of us couldn't convince a doctor in another state, just based on how many years we've been in this business, that we don't have some form of PTSD, we aren't, we aren't very good orators. And that's what happened. This firefighter convinced this, this doctor in another state in a telephone conversation that he had PTSD and thought that it would be his get out of jail free card. He was recreationally using, he was not using synthesizer or um, cannabis that had been refined for medical use. He was recreationally using marijuana, thinking that he had a uh, get out of jail free card. It ultimately cost him his, his job. And it's for, he's fortunate that it didn't cost him his life, uh, you know, because as, as, as Stephanie knows, as a paramedic, as Colette knows, his system being exposed to high temperatures and high stress would not have been reacting very well to THC in his system at, at higher levels. Well, and again, the, the perfect example of somebody doing an end around, because that's, I'll be honest with you, that when I, when we talked about doing this, that's the question I was already getting from people was, all right, I need to tune in because, you know, a lot of bosses are going, okay, the same thing. What happens when I get, you know, it's coming and they've already had it. Terry, you and I talked about this at length about, okay, I got this guy going on this, you know, they're doing this, you know, it's coming. And, and without this conversation, you know, answering, it, it's almost Bobby, when we did the COVID show, we had the doc out here and the two guys, you know, that, 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 you know, from Fort Worth that do the return to work physicals because so many fire chiefs are just putting people back to work without even checking them, all the legends out there. And, and, and then we had Homer on there and I took 22 pages of notes. I think you beat me with 26 pages of notes. I'm already writing stuff down that I'm sure a lot of other chiefs are going to write down about this conversation, you know, simple things like that's the question is what do I do when I have somebody come with this card how do I, how do I check to see if it's legit? How, you know, and then am I worried about HIPAA? I mean, there's HIPAA thing, all kinds of things that wrap into all, everything we do when it comes to medical backgrounds with our people, um, which that opens up a whole nother window as well. Stephanie, what, what drove you to do your article? Okay. So for our, for our listeners, our viewers. Well, really quickly, Chief, because I do have a fireman's ADD. I actually want to address that really quickly. Um, what you just said in a little bit of a, what Chief Ken we're, we're talking about. If we get ahead of this issue, if fire departments properly pre-plan, you go out and you find the doctors and you have contracts with them and you say, listen, here are these five doctors, different specialties, and these are the guys you can get your medical marijuana card from, and only these people. And that's why this conversation is so important is so departments can go out and get that game plan. So you're not having the guy who can cut corners saying, well, I have... I have a card from Grand Cayman doctor's office and it says I can smoke marijuana, uh, which is why this conversation is really important today to bring this stuff up so departments can troubleshoot it. Um, what got me to write that article was actually a podcast I had done with Pittsburgh Local One. And those guys are very unique in that they actually have it in their collective bargaining agreement, which I think they're the only ones in the nation to have it in their collective bargaining, which is pretty impressive. Everyone else just doesn't test for THC. And uh, I wanted to really sit down with them because I had started to develop some of your typical on the job injuries with um, just disc issues, sleep issues, stuff like that. And so I said, Hey, teach me about this because I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it anytime soon, but when the time comes, I don't want to be putting all this other junk in my system. I would rather just put one ingredient in my system. And I was very shocked with just the scope of knowledge that these guys had and that they brought to the table. Um, and that's really where the article came from, was just everything that they talked to me about and taught me about and then where I went and researched on my own. But uh, I would highly encourage other departments to go talk to Pittsburgh because they've really gone and they've taken as much of that sneak around the corner stuff that they can out of it. They've really, they've really designed a system to set them up for success 
because they're so honed in on protecting it because they know that that one guy can ruin it for everybody. So they've really set up a great system of, no, we, we've got these tight little margins and we're not going to have this taken away from us because one person screws it up for all of us. They have to go to dispensaries to get it. They have to have their receipts, um, just all kinds of great locks in place to make sure that none of that happens. And it's so really, where, truly, it's entered into the collective bargaining process for those. I've been doing yeah. that for a long time. You know, it's, it's entering into that process. And now you're talking, you know, a contract that you've got to, you know, everything else that goes into those contracts, you know, Bobby, you and I are, you know, very, very much uh, into those, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, we experience wise, because that's what we did forever uh, for me, at least before moving here. But, um, you know, having, I mean, it, it's coming. And again, a, a great conversation here. Go ahead, Bobby. And, and to Stephanie's point, this is, the medically approved use. This is not, we're not going into recreational. That's a, that's going to be another podcast once it's nationwide legalized or maybe we go state by state, but it's coming. And so that's another conversation, but this one and the, and to the Pittsburgh guys, and, and, and if you haven't listened to the podcast, <clears throat> Pete will link it. So you can listen to it. And it's a wonderful, great job, Stephanie, by the way. Excellent. It's an excellent podcast. I listened to it. Um, thoroughly impressed. So um, please listen to it. But that's another, you know, the, I, I just want to reinforce that. Keep these two conversations separate. We're not talking about the recreational use, which is legal. It, it, I just came back from New Jersey and I thought I was at a Grateful Dead concert in the parking lot of the hotel. Um, and, and God bless the Grateful Dead in the process. But the uh, um, it, it's so widespread. It's, it's amazing how just li literally Everywhere you went publicly, somebody was. Well, Bobby, that's what took me off surprise. I was in Maine. I mean, I, cause I'm not paying attention. We're having dinner, talking shop, and we come outside, we're talking parking. I'm like, Oh, I know that smell. And I'm looking, I'm like, Oh, and they go, yeah, it's proved recreation. I said, okay. I, it just took me by surprise. But again, here we've been talking about it for a lot of years, that side of it. Now you've got this side that we need to talk about as well. Good buddy. And, and as the official ombudsman, uh, thank you to, to uh, Gary Roberts he uh, says that he's been helping departments in Florida gain access to CBD and cannabis. Would love to connect. Actually, Boynton Beach here in Florida does have it in their CBA as well. So that's that's a second union uh, with it in their collective bargaining. Uh, that's awesome. Agreement. Well, and, and Terry, I'll, I'll throw this to you and Scott. I mean, I've always bragged on, on the colony, Scott, and on Louisville, Terry, as being um, very proactive cities, you know, T, you know, I, I, I point people to you all the time about your policies because everything that you guys do is vetted through the department of labor. You know, I mean, there was a town next to us, remember that got popped by the department of labor for their prejudiced hiring practices. And you, we know who we're talking about, you know, because of how they set up, how they do their hiring and other people with selling shifts and all the different things. And I always point to you guys going, if you want, if you want policies and procedures, that have been vetted legally and through the department. You get get with Lewis, we'll get the county because they'll send you stuff that's already been through that stuff. You know, Terry, you, you know, your HR department, I'll, I'll throw it to you first, has been very progressive with a lot of things. Um, you know, have you seen any issues or, or, you know, conversations or whatever that you could bring to the table or is it kind of in a holding pattern right now? So, I mean, internally, the, this issue hasn't been discussed. It hasn't been discussed within fire administration, hasn't been discussed uh, with human resources. I When when you mentioned this topic for a show, uh, you know, my, my, my first thought is, you know, what's the, the one thing that we all hate is change, right? So change is coming. It, it's going to come in one fashion or another. Um, the other thing is, is that this is going to make a lot of people uncomfortable which is okay. I think it's okay to be uncomfortable. I, I think that's the way we we progress and, and come out of the, the upside of this. A couple of my takeaways, like right from the very beginning, first of all, I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say Carrollton had a, a police officer struck and killed on the highway last night. Oh no. Um, and that's a that's a neighboring city to Louisville and, and to, to the colony. So I just want to just kind of acknowledge that and another another tragic, senseless uh, Carrollton death. Carrollton is the uh, one that everybody was giving a hard time because they just introduced the fire department, that blocking rig that is a tractor trailer that pulls out that hole. Yeah. And the very first night, the very first call, it got hit yep. on the highway, that gigantic blocking rig. The, those that are against that are out of their minds, not, not bringing a rig out. But go ahead, T, I'm sorry. 
Um, but but you know the other thing is is that when I when I sit here and and those resistant to change and in one way uh, in one way shape or form we all are it's just we're more passionate about some things than others and some things we're willing to just say oh it's you know it's life now and and we move on but I don't think there's anyone on this panel that is not acutely aware of the mental health issues that we are facing as a as a as a profession. Uh, we certainly have seen it in the military. We're seeing it in law enforcement, and it's getting worse, not better. And so, if we don't, and I say we, and I, I'm saying everybody's got a hand in this, if we don't get uh, creative and open our our minds to uh, how can we navigate this, and you know, I step outside of there hasn't been a firefighter that has been involved in a. Uh, a mass shooting event that I'm aware of as far as being a, a, a person who, who, who commits that, that offense. Right. So this entire country's got uh, some serious problems and there's a lot of reasons for all of it. But I will say, when you get back to the issues that have been brought up here and we talk about sleep deprivation or, or, or the, the, the issues of PTSD of what that's bringing in. And I'll also go out and make an assumption. Uh, and I, I look up across the, path here. I don't know. There might be two people on here young enough that they're not taking a daily medication for something. <laughs> and, and there are a number of us that are taking a number of different medications for something. And some of us are taking medication to counteract the other medication. And so it, and, and, but, but because of all of that, we've, we've grown accustomed to the fact that all oh, he takes hydrocodone, he takes uh, you know, high blood pressure medicine or, or, you know, something for AFib or whatever the case may be. And it doesn't ring any bells with us, but oh my gosh, bring up cannabis, marijuana, THC, CBD. It's just like we're, and, and to be honest with you, there's very few of us that know a flipping thing about any of it, other than we all tie it back to marijuana, Cheech and Chong and what the stigma is or was with marijuana. I will tell you, I, and, and I, I'll just leave this, this other statement off, uh, or, or as my last one, uh, but I think sometimes we don't get invested in an issue because we don't have a tie to it, right? We're not emotional about it. I always say this when it comes to elections, like people tie on to guns. Guns is what drives their vote. Abortion is what drives their vote. And 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 for whatever reason, I'm not saying it's right or wrong or, or indifferent, but if you know someone that's been just dramatically impacted by something, whether it's mental health, PTSD, they're, they're, it has caused a disruption or a dysfunction in your life, their life. If it's your child, if it's a, if it's someone in your extended family, whatever the case may be, guess what? Your perspective changes, right? And so maybe you are a little bit more open because I have sat on the side of the statement to where I say, I don't care. I, I don't care if that kid smoked weed every day, if it helped him or fixed him or or it made him not that person. Right. So, uh, you know, I, and I think that's where a lot of this comes from. And I think as fire administrators, people that are in this business, that your ultimate job at the end of the day is to is to make, uh, make you know, provide a, an environment where your people are healthy and safe and can retire and, and, and go on and, and, and live a happy life after this job. If this is a way to get us there, then we have, we need to educate ourselves. Right. So my, my hat's off to, to Colette and, and, and chief Perlman and, and, and Stephanie for, there's a lot of people that probably wouldn't even start this discussion because they don't want to get beat down and they don't want to be, you know, uh, beat up about it. So I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. This is uncomfortable. It, and I guarantee there's people listening to this today or listen to this tomorrow that will automatically, you know, just put up that barrier and go, that's it, man. What's the fire service coming to? We're all going to be smoking weed and, you know, whatever. But I'm telling you, 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 you ought to get out here and read some of these articles and get out here and talk to some of these people and some of the people in the mental health side of things or in the, in the peer support side of things and, and whatever. And, and I guarantee you, somewhere in your life, you know someone who, who, who may benefit from, from this type of treatment. Well, you're talking, you're looking at two guys. My big brother, Bobby, and I have sons that are veterans that, uh, you know, I know what, what his one son has been through. I know my son did, after, you know, after his tours in Afghanistan, uh, and what he went through with, with things that make me cry sometimes when I think about it. Um, I think you're right, Terry. It's like, we don't get, pa we get passionate about firefighter line to do that. It's only when we have one, we go to funerals, we cry, we stand there, but we don't, we don't go back and change the very thing that just killed them in another part. We stand there, we don't do anything. And, um, 
it's just a shame that it takes sometimes, you know, instead of forward thinking, it takes passion, that, like an experience or a near miss or something. But Colette, I said, so, so go ahead. I would, well, I just want to chime in and, and say, A, I love this conversation. And it's really such a privilege to be having it with people that are open to it. But I think as I wrote in the, in the paper that we wrote is like, if we don't talk about mental health and PTSD in the fire service as a part of this conversation with medical cannabis, then we're missing the point. And my area of expertise is trauma. And so the kind of elephant in the room for, you know, to use the phrase that you don't like (laughs) is that whether you understand or you believe it or not, it is my belief that every single firefighter on our, in our great country has trauma or PTSD because of just the nature of the job that you have signed up for. And although maybe it doesn't look like what you think it does as an Afghan war vet, or you've seen PTSD, that's this very wild, extreme nature. And so our brain says, oh, well, I don't have that. So I'm chilling. I'm good. I don't have PTSD. But the truth is, is that every single day that you walk onto a scene of an accident or you witness um, a brother or sister who has lost their life in the line of duty or just the exposure that your industry has to traumatic events and the what you have visually witnessed with your own eyes, that's trauma, that is PTSD. And so although this conversation definitely is directed and focused on the medical use of cannabis and in support of other practices that can support mental health and PTSD, it also is hopefully bringing some awareness that the fire industry, you men and women are so good at doing really, really hard, hard things, seeing really devastating scenes, and then just stuffing it down and keeping on, keeping on. The analogy that my dad has given me over my entire life is that he believes there's some carousel of images that he holds in his mind. And there's an arbitrary unknown number of images that he could see until finally one day the carousel just snaps and it breaks, right? So after 30, 40, 50 years on the job, how much have you witnessed and how does that affect you in your mind, in your emotion state? And then how does that affect your relationships, your relationships with your spouses, your partners, your children? And then how does that trickle out not only in the fire stations, but in the communities at large? And so I think that the medical cannabis conversation inside the fire service, if we pair it and couple it with the importance of mental health conversations and PTSD for the people that don't even really recognize or understand that they're actually holding symptoms of PTSD, how do we support them in wellness, right? It's not just about giving permission or not giving permission to consume cannabis. It's not about standard protocol and best practices to keep our firefighters safe on the job because that's a big part of it, but it's also the recognition that the future of the world in general, the phrase is called trauma informed, right? And everybody moving forward is going to want to understand what is, how does trauma affect us long-term? And so ultimately my heart in sharing this work and bringing this to the fire service is just that, that Let's find wellness inside of our fire stations. Let's find wellness inside of each of our communities and organizations and let the fire stations and the let the fire service be that safe space that it's always known to be, that community energy that the fire service has. But let's talk about mental health. Let's talk about PTSD because... um, as Chief McGrath had mentioned, like this is the epidemic that we're facing in our world, right? Our The big elephant in the room is not medical cannabis. The giant elephant in the room is that there is something happening across our nation that is creating illness in our mind. And that if we start here in the fire service in creating a community and a culture of safety around these types of conversations, then you invite that into your communities as well. Well, and, and I this is the perfect platform for, for this, Colette, because Scott and Terry have heard me say this. I work for a boss, Chief Bobby Halton, and, and you know where I'm going with this, Bobby. I've said it. I say it. I can't tell how many different programs I say this, especially the company officer cameras, the chief officer cam, Bobby. We we were I work. We well, we all work. We work for Bobby Halton, and and we work for a boss who doesn't just embrace mental health awareness; is very passionate about it. And and we I work for the largest magazine in the world the largest fire conference in the world. And we brought in the EMS side of it and everything else. And, and, and that what comes out of his office is it, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to talk to someone. It doesn't make you a coward or a weakling. In fact, if we did this decades ago, how many 
how many deaths, suicides, drug, drug addicts, alcoholics, marriages ruined, everything else. If leaders had just been a little bit more proactive on, you know, we're, we find there were cancer, you know, awareness, you burnt helmets are not cool and all this different stuff that were, but the mental health part of things, I, I remember working those firehouses when I got shot as a cop, I, you know what I was worried about when I went to counseling? They, except for Kenny Lubin, I was the only one on duty that didn't go to Vietnam. And I didn't want the Vietnam vets call me a, a wuss. I wasn't even concentrated on being, I, I didn't sleep for a week. I couldn't drink myself. I drank, I couldn't drink myself to sleep. Ended up shooting up Richie Spar's dad's house with a gun because I woke up and I thought I saw people in the window. It was a television. People got to get with this whole, I've some of the bravest people I know I've seen have, have some issues. And, and Bobby, I'm going to tell this real quick and I'll pass it on. We know Butchie Cobb. Butchie Cobb is a great, great guy. Butch Cobb retired with 40 years with the Jersey City Fire Department. Busy fire department, man. If you think New York City, they're busy. One of the Vietnam vet, Bobby Wright, medals down to here. And he was standing next to the globe on 9-11 when the buildings collapsed. And he saw New York, he went there mutual aid. He saw, he was on duty, saw New York City firebirds killed and it sent him back to Vietnam. And we're at John Salka's son, James, a major of the Marines at his wedding. And Butchie says, you know, Ricky, I'm seeing someone again. I'm seeing counselor. I said, oh, that's great, Butch. That's great. He goes, you know, the coolest thing about seeing a counselor. And I'm like, what's that, Butch? Do you, you, you have someone to talk to? He goes, no. Young firefighters are going up, coming up to me going, if it's okay for Butch to see someone, it must be okay for me to see someone. And I'm like, if we don't as fire service leadership, and Terry brought it up best, and you just brought up, lead the way. The article, Stephanie, that you wrote and talking with the people from Pittsburgh, Ken, what you guys are doing, if Bobby, if we don't lead the way, you know, then 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 it's a, the bag of marbles have hit the ground and are going in different directions, you know? And I just, I just want to mention this platform is perfect for supporting, you know, being advocates of mental health awareness, because everybody in this panel is a big believer in taking care of each other, not just phony words that it's for real. So, I mean, Bobby, I think, you would, you know, go, ahead, go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, you know, the, there's a, there's a nexus to this issue of, you know, without taking us down this rabbit hole, there's a nexus, you know, to Chief Halton's issue of the recreational use, and that's this. We also are gonna have to embrace the reality, face the truth, that what our members are doing off duty to self-medicate is likely more dangerous to their long-term health and wellness than the use of marijuana. Stephanie and I talked about this this week. Since 1978, I've never been to a marijuana overdose. Uh, she's got 19 years, never been to a marijuana overdose. I've had, a, in 14 years as fire chief, I had a lot of off-duty alcohol issues. I've had a lot of uh, opioid crises, right? And we're gonna to have to embrace that at some point as part of this and, and admit what we've accepted and what we ignore is, is probably less healthy than some of the alternatives that are being presented to us. We have to have well, at least the courage Ken, you brought that up. to have the conversation. Ken, you brought that up when we talk about this, about, you know, I just watched a video, a dash cam video the other night of a firefighter driving the opposite way on a highway, police chasing him. He didn't know he was being chased. He thought he had no idea where he was at. I, I listened to the tape. I'm going, he forgot he was at a whole city. He he skipped a whole city on a city on his thing. And I felt bad because I'm like, this guy's, I'm watching this guy ruin his career. And somewhere we missed that. You know, Bobby, how many times you said this? You you've talked about missed opportunities. Somewhere we missed it being able to help someone and 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 fix things. And and I, there's people that are no longer with us that if if there had been, I think, a proactiveness with the leadership, they'd still be with us. So, you hey, know, Chief, I want to, I want to tack on to something you were talking about earlier about how we are being so much better about mental health, and we're sending so many people to therapists, and people are going willingly. And a friend of mine just went to Center of Excellence um, to take a take a mental knee, essentially, and he said, you know, Steph, I walked in with a little sandwich bag full of medications for my mental health, and I walked out with a gallon size bag of medication. And he said, I asked them, you know, listen, I know medical marijuana would probably help me. Can I just take this one thing? And they said, hey, you know, we understand, but we're sorry, we don't have the power to prescribe that yet. And just that was, that was devastating to hear as someone who's an operational firefighter, just all the changes his body's now gonna have to go through and all the things that are now gonna be affecting him on duty Versus just this 
this one thing that we've stigmatized so much. And Chief Ken, he mentioned, we talked earlier, and I was saying it was very eye-opening during COVID. I think we all got kind of a front row seat to a little bit of alcoholism on, on every front because we were all, we all went home. We couldn't see anybody. And to unwind, we were grabbing a drink. The gyms were closed. It was all our coping mechanisms were taken away. And it was a very terrifying front row look at everybody abusing their livers a little bit for a year or two. And, um, and to think that that's the situation so many people are put in because well, we stigmatize this and we can't use it and we're not touching it, but you can't tell me not to go home and, and not to have bourbon with my eggs at 8 a.m. Well, part of that, and Bobby, I, want, I know you got something. I want to point, when we, when we did the, uh, the COVID show, Bobby, remember what the doctor said when I said, what advice do you have for the fire chiefs out there? He says, number one, you know, he talked about the shot. He said, number two, stop, stop going to social media. If you, if you need, if, if you have a heart problem, go to a heart expert, not your friend that, that never graduated, you know, from, or never took a chemistry or biology. If you have a lung problem, go to a lung specialist, stop going to social media. And this is the perfect topic for, you need to go to Colette. I'm just saying someone that this is, this is what they do. Bobby, how many times we said that we're, we're sitting across the desk from a doctor and you look over their shoulder. I really don't want to see a diploma in finance. If I'm there look, talking to a doctor, uh -huh. I want to see someone that specializes. So like the doc, the good doctor said, Andy Ellison's uh, memory, his father-in-law, stop going to social, go to the experts. And if you have questions, you should be seeing someone like, like, like and I'll just point right here at, at, at Colette that, that's their livelihood. That's their job is research development. I was just saying, I'm sure she would say I'm not an expert. Expertise. You know, your dad will call you an expert. You know, I'll call I, myself but, an expert. Well, I'll call well, myself an expert. <laughs> well, uh, it's like a lot of people say, oh, I'm, just, I'm not a you know mentor, but I'm just saying that you're the, you're the kind of person that people should go to and go, all right, help me with this because mm -hmm. I'm tired of watching like CNN or listening to someone on Twitter that is making up their own ending. So I mean, and that's the point that we were trying to make too in the paper is that like medical cannabis, PTSD, let's talk about it for the fire service. 100% we are advocates of it, but also firefighters with high doses of THC in their system is not safe. It's not wise for anybody. And so we are not in this position of like, just everybody start smoking weed. Let's go. Like, it'll help you. I believe that if you don't know how to work with cannabis, then it's likely that it's, it's not going to fully serve you to its potential. And so the accompaniment of using medical cannabis must also come with practices that support mental wellness, mental health, and also to bring a lot of awareness to the fire industry around what is the risk of firefighters showing up on duty with THC in their system? You know, I kind of, uh, I don't know, threw it out there. Let's do a stress test. Let's have some firefighters come in. Let's put, give them a little bit of cannabis and let's run them through a stress test so that the firefighters themselves can feel what it does to the heart, what it does to the body, what it does to the senses in a way that they will have reverence for this plant medicine, because it's not just let's smoke some weed and get high. And I could talk for hours on recreational cannabis is still 1000 times, 1 million times better than recreational bourbon for sure for the longevity of the health of your firefighters. So that's even a whole other conversation, but it's like, let's stress test people. Let's run them up, a, you know, 40 flights of stairs with, you know, however many pounds of hose you carry or send them into a burning building and let them see and feel physically what happens to the body when you have high levels of THC in your system, because quite frankly, it'll scare, scare them. It'll scare the well, bejesus out of them. Isn't that what they do? I just, we just talked about this with law enforcement, what they do for the breathalyzer or the, those people, you bring a partner in and they make them drink and, you know, Terry, you know, that stuff. And that's how you, have, in order to get certified, you have to hold, do a whole day of visualizing someone's eyes and reading all that stuff. We were talking about the training that law enforcement has to go through to even be one of those operators. Um, you know, Bobby, you, you know, it was the first thing you said. I know you, you had something. Uh, I, I kind of skipped past it. I'm sorry. Um, the first thing you said was, you know, I know you weren't against any of this, but you're like, just what, what Colette said, there, there, there's different levels. You know, you can't just say, here it is, and everybody do it. There, there's there's different things. Now, you've published many papers by the University of Illinois Fire Service Institute. I taught for them for 15 years. Back when we went to to, to the new NFPA 1500 ensemble and turnout gear, they did the studies 
and this is going to what you said, Colette, they did the studies at U of I. They brought firefighters in. I had friends. I was actually there as, as a safety guy when the guys, Johnny Hojek, all of them, and they put probes everywhere, not to get too descriptive, and they sent you in and sent you in. And Johnny came out after his like third bottle and he was talking gibberish. And we're like, do you even hear what you're, no, I'm good, man, send me in. You're, Scott, you know, Johnny, I'm good. No, you're not good. You're, you, you're, we were becoming disoriented on the hose line and leaving it because of the heat. We weren't even leaving the line. So you're right. I mean, there's there's the testing that has to be done that if we, if we did it enough for the turnout gear and Bobby, you published this stuff, the findings, why not for other stuff? But Bobby, go ahead. You had something before, buddy. Well, I've got so much. I mean, this, I, I realize we just got a few moments left, but you know, this conversation could go on for three days. Well, we could talk to the boss and he'll, he'll, oh, oh that's you. you. You've always, you've always said, keep going guys. So <laughs> well, the, the, the boss has kind of a hard break. Not in, I got, I, I, he's inundated today. Um, a couple of things, just very quickly. There's always the law of unintended consequences, which you have to keep in the back of your minds. I mean, for, for you know, for, for every wonderful step forward, there's a downside. And, and it's just, it's just the reality of war, of the world. Nothing, nothing is without consequence. And, and, and the best, the best product in the world can be abused, misused, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 in any myriad of ways, unimaginable ways. And so <clears throat> there's that. The other thing is, um, you know, if we keep this restricted to a highly controlled, medically, you know, necessitated um, activity, I can see where, you know, we really need to um, push this into, to, to, to Ken and Willette and Stephanie's eloquent point, they said much better than I can, but into collective bargaining where the people who can benefit from this, from the purely medical side of it, can, can, can get some relief for whatever they're dealing with. Um, and, and, and then finally, to the issue of, of mental health and, and, and the rest of it. Oh, first, uh, we should mention Butchie Cobb was a door gunner in Vietnam, hanging out the side of a Yui. And he knows better than anyone that the life expectancy of one of those men, and they were all men at the time, was about 15 minutes. So the fact that he flew innumerable missions and is alive to talk about it makes him one of the most fortunate human beings on the face of the planet. And he's grateful for it every day. But the, the final point I had is that um, the medical side of it, I can, I can see it, I'm there and I get all of that. The recreational side is a whole nother issue. And, and you know, keep in the back of your head that hydroxycobalamin, which we call cyanot that we give to people for smoke inhalation, is still not approved by the FDA for smoke inhalation. So the, the wickedly obtuse and slow moving approval process for things like this, which is really predicated on the amount of money that's generated behind the product that they're trying to get through the system is, is going to make that this even more difficult because I don't know that the marijuana industry and they all become industries. Trust me, I live in Oklahoma. We've got a dispensary next to every Baptist church in, in, and we've got more <laughs> Baptist churches than any place else in the world in Oklahoma. Seriously, uh, within, within, within five miles of me right now, there's probably 35 dispensaries and all we have is medical use. So, um, and we're voting in, on March 7th about recreational use um, of, of the upcoming year. So, and it'll pass. So, so there's that coming. And, and then finally, you know, I, I discovered this years ago, I'll just leave this and that'd be my last thought. I was in, a, we were at a chief's board meeting, uh, you know, chief's meeting. And I was, the, I think I was the deputy at the time. And there were 20 of us in the room, all white shirts, dressed up like Japanese admirals sitting there with the boss. And we were going over the questionnaire for the incoming recruits. And, and I looked at question 17 and I said, hey, other than me, who else lied on question 17? No hands went up. Well, one kid's hand went up. I didn't lie. And then the chief called him a liar. Question <laughs> 17 was, have you ever smoked marijuana? And if you answered yes, you didn't get in. If you answered no, you got in. Now, I'm not going to talk for everybody on the call. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. But I lied, you know. And uh, we're not hiring choir boys. We're not hiring people for the Emanuel Kant Society where you can never lie or the Sisters of Charity. We're hiring firefighters. And so 
it's a it's such a tough tough nut to crack right and if we don't my point with the editorial two and a half years ago was and stephanie's point let's freaking get ahead of it for gosh sakes for once in our lives let's not be ambulance chasers you know let's not be you know cheap lawyers with you know handing out cards to accident victims for god's sakes let's let's try to be proactive for once at least on the medical side the recreational side is going to end up in court and people men in black dresses are going to tell us what to do but not that that's unusual today but but there you go so hope well, I it, hope I pissed off everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it's true. And it, and and it all kidding aside, you know, when I joked about the elephant in the room thing, Colette, you know, there's phrases like stay in your lane, you know, think out of box. It's they get so overused. That's what I mean. But it is, it's it's been sitting here the whole time for years now. And everybody's just kind of went, okay. And they've just they've just and 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 like like Bobby said in the fire service, unfortunately, we are a reactionary group. Our whole our whole life since Ben Franklin created the first fire fire department in 1736 has been to react to things. Why not get a, ahead of something? Like Scott, you've been quiet the whole time. You got to jump in here. You know, come on. You, you know, no, I agree with what everybody's saying. I, I'm I see the value in it 100. percent You know, both my sons are on the job. They're busy firefighters in big cities. And, and I see how the job has changed them. And uh, if there's an opportunity for, for, you know, something to help them not only make it through their career, but to retire and be held. So I certainly see the benefit of it. Um, it. It's, it's probably not something that's on the top of my priority list right now, but you know, I'm a reader and I'm reading as much as I can about it, but I, I learned a lot of things about the leadership in the fire service with 4896 and how we address the, the whole cancer deal. And I can tell you the people I'm going to listen to and the people I'm not going to listen to. And, and, you know, there's so much emotion based opinion flying around amongst fire chiefs that, you know, like, like you said, I want to, I want to poke my eyes out and you try to get into the weeds and that's where the discussion ends. But, you know, I, I think it's just something that we're going to learn about. Um, I work for a city that's very pro-employee, probably the most employee-focused that, that, that I've had the opportunity to work with. So we're always going to look and say, really, what's best for the individual and, and keeping them on the job and helping them make it to retirement in all departments, not just the fire department. But uh, I certainly see advantages to it. I, I think uh, when that day comes, which, which is in the very near future, you know, we'll, we'll sit down and we'll find a way to manage it. And, and, and we'll take it and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do what we can with it. But uh, it's, it's just not something that, that I certainly feel like I'm an expert on. I'm, I'm reading a lot of things about, you know, when CBD was being sold in Texas, we had that conversation. And, and what about those who show up with traces of, of a THC? And, and so we're talking about it. It's just, it's just something that's, it's, it hasn't made it to the top of the list, but I agree with everybody. We need to get ahead of it, but I certainly see the value of it. I'm, I'm not afraid of it at all. I think if we understand it, the medical side of it, that, that there's some great benefits there and, and we need to find a way to use that to, to, to make our people whole and, and, and long lasting. So I, it's well, just kind and, of. It's got, it goes to the paper that Ken and Colette wrote for the Texas fire chief. To, I mean, th there's, th there were, we're ahead of the curve, at least on that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, we're way behind on this, but we're way ahead, if that makes sense to you. My my son, Bobby, you know, my son was a, a six-year Navy corpsman, FMF corpsman, that's Fleet Marine Force. So he was a, you can't say this to a corpsman, I get very upset, but he's a combat medic assigned to the Marines. So that was his job. And when he wasn't deployed to Afghanistan, at 20, his base was 29 Palms, he ran the clinic. He was the PA at the clinic. He fixed carpal tunnel. He did all, and he has stories to tell you about Marines that have done and sailors that have done 12, 13, 14 deployments. You know, my friend, Bruce Crandall uh, for the helicopter pilot from We Were Soldiers, Medal of Honor recipient, he told me we we're on an airplane ride together. He says, we are sitting on a ticking time bomb when it comes to mental health with servicemen and women that have deployed. He goes, when I did my year and a half of Vietnam and I did another one, that's because I was a lifer. And this is a guy that went on over 700 missions if you watch the movie we were soldiers with Mel Gibson, he's the helicopter pilot, Snake, Snake Shit. That was his name. All right. That was his nickname. And he says, we're sitting on a ticking time bomb of all these men and women, you know, that have done all these deployments. And there, there's another guy that, you know, I mean, you, you, that, that's on top of it saying we've got to do something when it comes to PTSD. So let's let's do this. Let's kind of go around the table here. Um, um, and I'm a 
now my my picture's all changed. Um, Colette, let's start with you. If you let, summarize, finish up, what advice? Our audience here is going to be a lot of firefighters, fire chiefs, officers, and then probably, you know, who knows? Some, some people may tell their HR people you need to watch this. So if you were going to summarize your thoughts, your beliefs, your support, your expertise, what would it be? Goodness. I think that the, the thing I would love to leave this conversation with is that even abused cannabis consumption is infinitely less dangerous, less harmful, and less risky to the communities, the fire service, the equipment, the efforts of the fire department is exponentially less risky than moderate even alcohol consumption or pharmaceutical mixing of multiple different uppers, downers, and all these different things in the way that they affect the body. And so the fear or the stigma around this plant and this, and this plant is that we're so afraid of the abuse. We're so afraid of this shadow side of it. We're so afraid that it's going to be falling into the wrong hands. But I, my ex expertise in this is that even in the wrong hands and even in an abusive situation where someone's over consuming in order to cope with their mental health or their positioning, it's going to create a little bit of a sleepier person, a little bit of a, you know, little, little lethargicness, right? It's not going to create a trail of dead bodies. And I think that that's really the most important part about understanding breaking our stigma. It's not just about educating about what it can do, how to get it into the hands of people that really need it and could benefit from it. But it's also allowing us to not be afraid of it. We don't have to be afraid of it inside of the fire service. Even the notion of people using it recreationally or using it irresponsibly or getting a medical card in order to have access to it, that's still far safer, far safer for our firefighters than to send them out to have a handful of opioids and a bottle of whatever in order to deal with what they're working through. And so um, medical cannabis, when paired with other practices of wellness, meaning meditation and even yoga or movement, breath work, different things that I offer and bring to the table and having bigger and greater conversations around mental health in the fire service, I think is the opportunity here that um, shouldn't be missed. It's not just about getting ahead of medical cannabis. It's about standing firm and drawing a boundary and saying the fire service as a whole cares about the mental health of our people. And we care about the culture inside of our fire stations that makes it attractive to young people coming into the service so that you can continue to recruit high quality individuals that want to be in service to our communities, because ultimately that's what we need. So if the fire service stands on a place where we care about your mental health. We offer this education. We offer these other benefits or these other um, practices and ways to support you in your mental health. Then the fire service becomes a very appealing place for people to come and land and then spend their lives and their careers in serving our communities. And being in service to the community is how we attend to the mental health epidemic that's happening in our country that we're seeing through the violence and the shootings and all of these other things. I believe that we the fire service can be the pinnacle for shifting that. That's a great message. And, and, and again, wonderful that I, I just love the fact we were able to discuss this and we could do eight hours, like Bobby said, and still not cover everything just on the medical side of it, let alone the other side. Colette, if, if someone wanted to reach out to you, you know, um, what's the best way for them to get a hold? If they had questions, they want to, they want to consult with you, um, whatever, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? My website is called uh, balancingcannabis.com. And so if you just go www.balancingcannabis.com, you'll see all the information about myself, the practices that I offer, the education that I do, the way that I work with people one-on-one, -on -one, the way I work with organizations um, in bringing education and cannabis experiences. So teaching people how to really work with this plant, um, you can find all of it on my website, balancingcannabis.com. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Stephanie, sum summarize for us. And then same thing with some contact info. I think if we're going to claim to be wellness advocates for the fire service, we have to really look at the longevity of someone's career. That's the whole goal of wellness in the fire service is A, to make sure they're mentally okay, and B, to make sure that they have a long career. And right now, our only options are grocery bags full of mental wellness medications um, or opioids for pain. And so we really need to take a step back and saying, are we doing our people a huge disservice by the medications that are available for them? It's as simple as that. It's about getting our people to that finish line and getting them healthy beyond, but while they're still here. Um, talk to, I would tell departments that are looking into this, talk to cannabis lobbyists. 
They're the ones that um, talk to Colette, but also talk to Canada's lobbyists. They're the ones that are subject matter experts on this and they will come out, they will talk to you, they will train you, get ahead of this. So that way it not only, you avoid disaster in your department, but also you can implement successful policies for it if it's something that you decide to do for your department. But it is something that's gonna happen. There are five more states on the docket right now. Maryland, which is right next to me, is one of them. They're about to most likely legalize cannabis use um, for, I think at least one of them might be recreational, but definitely for medical. It's it's gonna be eventually all 50 states. We're gonna get there and, and then it'll get federally decriminalized. Get out ahead of it and don't just get out ahead of it to, to avoid trouble. Do it because it could help your people. Look into it, do your research. Perfect. How do we, how do we get a hold of you if somebody wants to reach out to Stephanie? It's Stephanie dot k dot white at gmail.com perfect 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 and and pete um i think pete did it already but pete's going to uh uh link your article to this so people have that as well uh if they want to click on your article um uh i sh i know i shared it a bunch of times but pete's really good with doing that chief Prilliman, sum it up buddy what do you got well it, i appreciate so much uh uh, Chief Halton and, and yourself, the rest of the hosts, uh, giving us some time today. You know, my my goal originally was just to to get the conversation started. You know, for a fire chief uh, to wait until a firefighter shows up with a card uh, and and to have to deal with this in the middle of one of those is is too late, too hard, and and, and leads to short answers. As a fire service, the last thing we want to Chief Halton's uh, point is. We don't want guys in black robes making these decisions for us. We're either going to be forced into accepting things that are more dangerous for our folks, or we're going to be left with our nose pressed up against the window and wish we would have been allowed into the conversation. Finally, I would say, you know, collectively across this country, we have spent hundreds of millions of dollars under the banner of firefighter health and wellness. It's second set of gear, it's clean cab, it's treatment centers, it's peer support, the list goes on and on. And in that vein, my encouragement is just be open-minded. If you'll spend the time looking at the science and the research, you'll come to recognize that, that this has some real potential and it may not work in every single jurisdiction due to political issues or others, but at least be open-minded to the possibility that this too could help keep a good member on one of your trucks. Perfect. Chief, if they want to get a hold of you, email address? Uh, Ken.Prilliman, Wichita Falls, tx.gov. Perfect. Perfect. He was very, Bobby, he was very, uh, very delicate uh, referring to the cave people, the cavemen and women in the fire service that we deal with that mm -hmm. haven't crawled out of their their caves yet to deal with stuff, but Scott, you got any closing remarks? Are you good? No. I know we just pitch it. You can get me at Scott at fireserviceleadership.com. And, and I just want to end with saying, you know, it's coming. It, it, it's, we've all talked about it. It's something we got to address. Let's get ahead of it. But uh, th this is what I want to close with. And, and, you know, as fire chiefs, we're getting more worried about curing all our people. And, and that's a big part of our job. But one of the things that we've implemented in our mentoring program, it's kind of a day one meeting thing is, we also got to make sure we're, we're, we're encouraging our people to take responsibility for their own health and welfare. And, and, you know, we have a day one thing that says, do you understand what you're getting into? You know, you're going to have mental scars. You're going to have sleep disruption. And we're going to try to give you the best programs to help get you through that. But at the end of the day, you have to take some responsibility for your own uh, health and, and well-being. And I think fire chiefs were getting overly aggressive at, at maybe trying to cure everybody and create this perfect person and that's never going to happen because we're human beings. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do. Don't get me wrong, but it's a, it's a two-way proposition. Uh, we'll provide the systems and, and all those things, but the individual at the end of the day really has to be educated and understand what it's going to take to survive this career. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. Well, that was perfect too. And, and you're right. I mean, it's, you know, I, I love the fact because you guys are so proactive with day one, you start with the mentoring and the orientation and stuff. Um, Ken, uh, we talked about this um, you, you said you'd be good with making the paper that you and Colette uh, drafted uh, available, except you have to make one minor clarification, right? Is that still true to get it to P? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get that done here within the hour. We'll get it off to uh, you and, and Fire Engineering so that it can be posted with the podcast. 
Okay, Pete, we'll we'll uh, send you that copy as well, so you can update it, uh, buddy. When I when I get that from Ken, Terry, closing thoughts before we get to the boss. Um, you know, I, I, you kind of alluded to this earlier, Chief, and and I think I've witnessed this here in in our agency, and unfortunately, you know, that it, and and Scott makes an excellent point is that we need to do our part, but everyone, you know, our, our personnel need to do their part as well. And, and, and they need to give themselves the best opportunity to be healthy and, and to recover and to, 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 to come out of this career successful. But, um, you know, one of the things I, I feel like I've noticed here when it comes to someone who has gone down a path and they get to, you know, this, the, the path leads them to a, a place that nobody wants them to be in. They don't want to be there. And it's, it's filled with uh, misery and hard decisions. And, and, uh, and, but, you know, the one thing I've always thought of chief and, and is, is that usually that path is kind of long and meandering and, and winding and, and, and we need to pay attention to the people on the path. Um, it, it just, I don't think any station officer and I don't think anyone who is close, we use the term brotherhood and, and we, we beat this up a lot, but you got to pay attention to these people around you and, and, all of what we're talking about to here today is is applicable and it's great and I think it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a beacon of hope if you will because you know if this is something that works for some people then I'm all for it but you know I, getting back to the uh, the to my first uh, part of this is that you got to understand the people that are working for you and you've got to you got to get involved in their business and get in their lives and 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 speak up and say something and that's part of being a, a chief officer a station officer that is your role and responsibility and it's uncomfortable yeah i used that word earlier it's uncomfortable that's right it's going to be uncomfortable get used to it and uh and so you know my my word out there for for everybody is educate yourself on this and then make sure that you're doing everything you possibly can to be proactive in your departments to uh to to intersect people on that path and how many times terry have we said you know, we all, you know, we all talk about brotherhood and I always say there's a her in my brotherhood. Okay. Um, you know, if you truly believe in, in what that, what that means and have your arms wrapped around then you as firefighters, forget even the company officers. I think senior firefighters get more done in the firehouse than the officers. There's stuff that goes on. They take care of those men and women fix more. If you're a successful company officer, you are because you've got a senior guy or gal right there taking care of stuff for you on the floor. And senior firefighters can have a heart to heart with you that you're not going to get grieved on, that you're not going to upset. You know, they'll get upset when Captain Prilliman comes to them and leans on them, but they're not going to get upset when Firefighter Jones comes and says, hey, come here for a second, really? Or, and have that talk. Be what you say you are. All the tattoos and hats and stickers and T-shirts we have, be that person and, and take care of it. Truly really be that that person. Bobby, finish. Oh, I'm sorry, Terry, uh, email for you, buddy. Yeah, it's first initial, last name. So T McGrath at cityoflewisville.com. And I also just sent your email out on our other show to uh, for people to get a holy bia for a bunch of stuff regarding the, the Helping Hand program. <laughs> so you're going to get a bunch of emails. Bobby, Chief Halton, the boss, closing thoughts, buddy? You're muted, bud. Damn technology. <laughs> two, two thoughts. Um, first, thank you to all our guests. And, and I would like to extend an invitation to return because I think that there's much more to be said about this, uh, obviously. Uh, to everybody listening, two points. Um, to, to Stephanie's point, that we should have a sense of urgency but also we do have some discretionary time. Not a lot, but we have some. So, uh, you know, con contact Chief Perlman, contact Colette, contact Stephanie, um, you know, get, get the best, you know, contact the folks, was it, Bo was it Boca, I guess he said, had it? The Boca, Got Pittsburgh. Folks in Pittsburgh, you know, talk to the people who have kind of thought it through and then, and then take it into your own system because firefighting is parochial. And, and, and keep it in the back of your mind that there's a, there's a there's a chasm of thought between Colonel Jessup and Gomer Pyle, right? In other words, it, and, and always if you think about it, you know, somewhere in the middle you find, you know, um, the right answer, a pea bladder type of uh, answer. So just just hold that thought, right? And and we talked about a lot of things in this conversation, and 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 that's a good thing, but it just shows you how much we have. To, to say grace over, you know, sitting behind the desk. And, and, and to Scott's point, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about to a great extent was 
personal personal responsibility, resiliency, uh, helping people to up front up upload that up front before they, you know, before they go into this career, right? Um, so so there's that. But thank you again to everyone. I would like to extend to to Steph and Colette and Ken. Uh, you know, please come back when when you want and when or you have some kind of you know thought you want to share with us. This is a this is something that I think the fire service needs to uh, get a handle on and, and, and think it through um, and, and do it right um, rather than do it over, which we seem to be really good at, you know, <laughs> let's try to do it right the first time. And so, but thank you to everyone. Thank you everybody who joined with us on Facebook and all the uh, other social media venues where you can see this. Um, thank you as always to Terry and Scott and, and Rick, John, I hope you get better soon. Um, and and uh, we'll see you all back here next week on Pump Hangout. Perfect, perfect. This was this was a wonderful opportunity to, to discuss this, Chief. Like you said, our next show uh, day for this group for issues and challenges is November sixteenth. I always end this for us. Terry does as well, Scott. You know, fire engineering always has some great hump day hangouts here on Wednesdays. They're awesome. Don't forget about all the podcasts in the evening. Uh, they are they're incredible groups of guys and gals out there doing great stuff. Um, please uh, check them out. Go to fireengineering.com and you'll find the other 50,000 websites that Bobby oversees with all the magazines and sites and everything else. You can find everything right there. It's so easy right there. Um, but thank you, everybody. This was wonderful. Hang on. Don't sign off uh, so we can say our goodbyes. But in closing, we always ask you, and this is very uh, – very, very important to, uh, I know at least three of us that that have that have kids that uh, have served or are still serving Chief Halton, but we always ask you to please keep the men and women in our, in our armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember this, never forgetting means never forgetting. Be safe. Thank you. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.